Hey Alex, welcome to the AppScript podcast. It's a it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. So, how are you feeling? Good. Good. Nursing a little bit of a cold for the past few days, but otherwise very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm doing good as well. So, um uh I'll I'll quickly just brief uh, for the audience who are, you know, not aware of the AppScript podcast and watching this for the first time. So, what we do here is uh we invite experts and founders across different industries and we talk to them about uh you know their industry about the business about everything uh, that they you know work on so that anyone who is starting uh, a venture of their own or uh, probably you know getting into a role which is very uh, business centric where they have to work on strategies and all of that they can get some valuable uh, insights and some other values out of uh, these uh, conversations and probably apply them in their own business or their own work right so that's what we do here so uh without wasting any more time uh welcome alex so i'll just quickly start with you know if you can tell a little bit about yourself first so that we get some context about this conversation so a little bit about your background and how has been your journey like so far yeah of course um so we spent the last 25 years or so studying and working in the uk and across most of the uh, most of europe uh graduated in economics and maths then uh, graduated being list in in business and then in uh, did an MBA in France at INSEAD uh, and between all of these uh first I worked for IBM for a few years doing tech tech transformation projects across different industries <coughs> after that uh spent a little bit of time uh in consultancy in London and then uh worked for about um 8 years for Bain and Company uh in their management consulting and private equity parts of the business um there i spent a lot of time on tech financial services as well as uh, some time in the private equity where i did due diligence okay so working on uh uh on deals with private equity funds there I specialized actually in aggregators as well so some of the deals that did were around aggregators whether it's the food or or um uh real estate space and so on. Uh now for the past one year I uh, I've joined Glovo uh which is a food delivery company uh based in in Europe and in Africa. Um part of Delivery Hero uh and uh, I've been the general manager for Bulgaria for the past year as well as in the past couple of months I've picked up uh four more countries to to help manage interesting interesting so uh i'll just quickly tell you that we have been in this business uh, for like almost 10 years of like app development and we help startups and you know other founders build their technology build their product right so glovo is one of those companies which we have been following for a long time to you know understand how they build their product so their product is very interesting and also i think now glovo has become a super app sort of right so it has food delivery its pharmacy and all of those things so which is like insane and we also have a you know a product that is super app where we help uh, you know entrepreneurs build super apps build food delivery uh, uh, you know uh, and uh, food delivery stack and there's a the pharmacy delivery stack and all of that so of course glovo has been a big inspiration for us in uh, terms of product development so good to have you here in that terms so uh, i would like to know from you like uh, you know what what uh, uh you know made you like what was the click you know f- when you are switching from bain and company to glovo so you know what kind of you know uh, made you uh, take that decision that you know glovo is sort of the right sort of company where i should you know uh, go next and this would probably be a a great one yeah okay so uh l- let's let's do this so first the industry itself um uh, i actually find it very very interesting so uh the food aggregator space and quick commerce in general i think they're very new especially compared to financial services for example uh so there's a lot of things to figure out and a lot of actually problems to solve um which uh i actually find very very interesting uh and and second i actually really believe in the value proposition for the aggregators so what they actually do uh and the value they bring to customers this is actually something I subscribe to I'm a heavy user of these applications so this is actually something I believe in quite a lot <coughs> now beyond this glovo is i think glovo is one of the one of the best companies um in in um, in the industry right so 
They started in Spain uh, over, you know, six, seven years. Uh, the founder, Oscar, um, and, and as well as Sasha, have actually built it into one of the powerhouses. They've expanded all across the, the world. They've had many successes. They've also done a few mistakes, as, as every startup would do. But I think they've managed to establish the companies in one of the best and, and the largest. So uh, joining them, this was actually one of the big factors. And second was their culture. I think it's a great company to work for. Actually, everything they, they, uh, uh, that we actually subscribe to as a culture, I, I fully believe in. It's also part of, I see very, very similar, big similarities to <clears throat> what I had in Bain and what I had at INSEAD as well. So a lot of commonalities so that this was a big, big reason. Awesome. Uh, so you said like, uh, you know, Globo has, uh, uh, has been in like one of the best in this space, in this industry. So what do you think, you know, Globo has been able to crack, which a lot of other businesses in this space are probably still struggling with because, you know, quick commerce and food delivery businesses, these are very, you know, high competition market. And they're also like, you know, th there are a lot of talks and rumors in the market where they, they say that, you know, a lot of businesses are yet not able to crack the solid business model of, you know, how to launch it in the right way and scale and grow. So what do you think that Glovo did right, which a lot of other businesses are unable to figure out? Okay. So I think, first of all, it's important to, to uh, separate a uh, little bit quick commerce from food delivery. So you have players like Glovo, for example, who also play, first of all, play in the food delivery business. So they deliver from restaurants and they not only aggregate the number of restaurants on the platform, Okay, but they also uh, execute the operations behind it for a number of these restaurants. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part is let's call it the quick commerce section, which is going to be mostly around, say, groceries or retail. And that actually splits into to two parts, right? There's the, um, there's the part where you would work with retailers or grocers much the same way you would work with restaurants. So say you would have uh, large, large brands, supermarkets, where you would have uh, them on the platform and then a picker would pick everything that your customer delivers and then you would end up delivering to them. That's the first part. The second part is where you would actually, the company itself, like Glovo or, or other players, would establish a micro-fulfillment center. So it's essentially a dark store or in many ways, um, a kind of a, a mini, mini warehouse, okay, if you wish, uh, where the company itself would not only do the delivery, would not only actually uh, procure the order, but they would actually do the fulfillment of the products themselves. So they are actually selling the product itself, okay? So what has Global been, been able to crack? So first of all, I think on the food delivery space, I think... Uh, Glovo has been, I think, very good at expanding very quickly across many markets to win scale. And actually, in any aggregative space, scale matters a lot. Number two, they've been fairly quick, and I think they've been getting quicker to recognize some bets that didn't pay off. So they shut them down. Okay. Well, so basically, the money bled. Uh, would be stopped. And I think third, uh, the business model they chose was first to work with, uh, let's say, retailers, large retailers and restaurants and so on, uh, before opening their own micro-fulfillment centers, right, which makes a big difference to, to margins compared to, say, some pure play players like Flink or GoPuff or Gatier, right, which is one of the biggest ones. Uh, where they only pure play, they only set up their own stores and they only uh, deliver from them, and they only attract customers to their own app. Interesting, interesting. So so basically what you're saying is that, you know, uh, a lot of businesses uh, could have, you know, where, where Glovo went right was basically understand, you know, what is working and what is not working very quickly on their journey probably. And then what is not working, you should shut as soon as possible. So probably a lot of founders go wrong there that, you know, even if something is not working, just because they have put so much effort into it, they just tend to continue that journey for a little longer and they drag it until they, you know, get onto that conclusion that, oh, shit, this is just not working out and that it gets too late. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I've spoken to to uh, the founder of Globo a few times and he's been very honest about how, how hard it is sometimes to actually let go of these bets 
that you strongly believe in, but for one reason or another, then they'll pay out. So I think there, the experience of the founder, as well as the people he or she surrounds uh, themselves with can make a very, very big, big difference. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, what do you think? Like, you know, what are the, uh, uh, what are the, is there a way to sort of course correct r- right now for other businesses? For example, say the, uh, say the businesses out there in the quick commerce space, which have been, uh, you know, uh, which have been in this space for quite some time, but are still struggling to make money, right? And are still uh, making huge losses. So, how do you think sort of there is, is there a way to course correct at all? Like, what do you think about that? Okay, so, so, um, so first of all, when, it, when, when we talk about course correcting, so there's, um, I think there's a lot of, let's say, um, people across the, I think across the investment space as well, and a lot of challenges on does the business model for, let's say, quick commerce, for example, if we pick that, uh, does that actually work, right? Uh, do the numbers stack up? You've been burning a lot of investor cash for the past few years, right? Uh, you're constantly losing money. This isn't really going anywhere, right? These, these businesses are, you know, it's very easy to grow when you're selling, uh, you know, uh, 20, 20,000, uh, sorry, $20 bills for $10 bills, right? It's very easy to grow. Um, so I think what's important, at least the way I think about it is, First of all, the business fundamentals there are actually fine. So there isn't anything for these companies to, to really fundamentally address. So I've seen it uh, in many, uh, you know, many players in the industry that you would have these micro fulfillment centers. So these dark stores be actually uh, positive, right? So they'd be a bit positive or cash flow positive. So there's many examples across many of the big players, whether it's Delivery Hero, whether it's Flink, uh, right, so for example, Flink 20% of their uh, of their dark stores are actually positive, right? Profitability positive. Uh, you would actually have in Delivery Hero, I think, um, you know, their top seven best performing countries, the dark stores there or DMARTs or equivalents, are actually adjusted to be that positive as well. Okay, and even the biggest ones and the ones that the best performing ones are seven percent. Uh, deliver more than 7% margins on a just a bit the basis. Okay. So I think fundamentally, I don't think there's a problem with the business model. You drop enough costs compared to say a normal grocer um, to, to then be able to accommodate for the new ones you add. Okay. Uh, so the rent and so on and so forth. Um, I think the, the reason why this massive burn was happening is actually two, two things. First of all, there was a lot of money flying around. So Obviously, there was a lot of money given by investors with, let's say, very little uh, burden of proof needed, number one. Number two, it was a uh, really uh, the right time. So especially around COVID, where the majority of the investments happened, this was the chance for this industry to step up its development, uh, you know, and basically skip, say, five to ten years in development. Right. Uh, and number three, there was a massive fight for share. Okay, so the majority of the money that was spent wasn't that much on faulty business fundamentals. It was spent on massive share gains or you know fight for share in a very very short space of time. So if you think about the marketing spend, if you think about the amount of vouchers, if you think about everything, right? To to uh, get everything up and running. This is partly to win share, partly to jumpstart the industry very, very quickly. And this costs money. Right, but when you clear this all up and when uh, you look at the numbers across many players, and these are public numbers, right? So I'm not really even discussing something you need to be on the inside. There's enough for you to, to understand that actually this, these could be very profitable businesses. To, to answer your question, so I don't think there's anything that fundamentally need to, to, to change, right? Having said that, I think, uh, especially the pure play com, um, QCOM players, uh, like Gatier or Plink, um, would have a kind of a big, let's say, big question mark this year around where to get that extra financing uh, without having to, to really... Uh, cut their valuations uh, substantially because they need that money, right? They're still not quite positive 
across the whole business. They need to find that money. Right now, markets are pretty poor when it comes to funding. Right, so so they will have to take uh, big hits un, un, unless they find another way. Right. Uh, do you also think like there there has been this uh, debate uh, in the market that you know a lot of founders, especially in the you know the first initial probably two three years, they have focused a lot more on especially the founders I'm talking about have spent a lot of lot more time on you know raising more funds than you know working more on the business and you know how to grow the business and you know increase the revenue sort of but they were more concerned about you know how to raise more money quickly and sometimes even you know they have raised more money than what they actually needed and there have been talks like you know even the investors have said them that you know even if you don't need it just spend the money you know we have given you the money just spend it what will you do with that money if you don't spend it so that is also why a lot of founders have you know spent like insane marketing spends were there and also you know there have been hires with like insane salaries which were not practical, right? So what, what is your take on that? Um, yeah, so look, I mean, so first of all, um, a lot of the investments done, they were, uh, these were growth investments, right? So, and especially when you're in a, in a situation around COVID, when this is the perfect time to grow, uh, especially when you have the capital, it's kind of hard not to, right? So I wouldn't really, blame the, the founders themselves, right, for, for spending the money, number number one. Um, number two, I think when you spend that money, there is the expectation that actually you are burning it to create that demand, first of all, and number two, then get a large share of it, okay? So, so you have to do that. Um, and uh, I think that was just, let's say a name of the game for, for the first few years, you know, around 2020, 2021. Um, now, I think what was probably key was uh, for founders to truly understand how good their value proposition is and how sustainable once they actually spend the money and once they create the demand and once they actually get a, a market share, I think it's more about in the long term would there be some, you know, some benefits out of this whole thing? And let me give you an example. So say pure play Qcom players, right? Um, anybody investing in them, um, and, and I think you have very, very good success stories like Gitir, for example, right? So massive uh, downloads, massive demand, massive growth, huge network across, um, across the continents. Um, but in the long term, you kind of have to, uh, you know, wonder what is the value proposition compared to, say, some of the hybrid players, like, say, for example, Global. I mean, I give Global as an example, but there's many of these uh, who also have MFCs, but also have food delivery businesses or versus normal grocers, right? Say, uh, like the big chains, whether it's the Walmarts, Kauflands of the world, Reva Group, etc. So th this, is, this becomes a little bit of a question mark. Are they going to be able to do something that's unique and very different? Because um, the 15-minute value proposition, right, um, it turns out that this doesn't actually matter all that much, right? So there's a lot of uh, analysis done across many of the different players, right, whether it's Joker, whether it's others. Joker is another pure play um, uh, uh, Qcom uh, company, uh, is that actually the retention of customers when you compare it to 15 minute delivery or 30 minute delivery or even 40 minute delivery is not that different, right? But you can imagine the amount of money it costs to actually do the operations in 15 minutes and the investment you need and complexity is very different versus 40 minutes. So if that doesn't matter all that much as a value proposition, then you've got to wonder uh, what else would really make a difference versus, say, a Walmart being able to make the deliveries within 30 to 40 minutes or some of the other Kroger's in the U.S. or some of the other players that would also have density of stores in, in the cities where they can actually fulfill. Um, and it's not a simple answer, right? If these, these big players actually can do it themselves, other you know, partnering with companies like uh, um, like uh, Global, for example, or doing it themselves is you know it becomes very difficult. 
The, the second thing is when you compete against uh, hybrid players that not only have MFCs but also food delivery, the scale they have of orders, let's say density, is is much more significant, right? Uh, number number one, meaning uh, you know people that order food, people that order groceries, they're very very similar, right? This is not like taxi rides versus food delivery, right? Let's see closer than this so so first the scale will be a lot bigger second uh, the density would be a lot uh, a lot higher so the, the costs of operation will probably be lower and delivery times probably be even better so uh, there it becomes a little bit more of a question mark how would you really compete uh, uh, and and that's not that's not an easy answer uh, do you think that uh, you know the quick commerce and food delivery industry has reached uh, some sort of a saturation in terms of like new players coming in, or is there still enough potential for new players to come in with a you know unique business model or a unique value proposition and still make it? So, <coughs> so first of all, it's a very nascent industry, right? So the the new customer penetration or even the sign up penetration tend to be generally fairly low across most countries. Of course, it varies, could vary quite significantly, but fundamentally, it's a very, very new industry, especially compared to some others. Um, so from that perspective, there, you know, there's a lot more space for new players to come in. However, um, let's say that the more time passes becomes extremely, extremely uh, expensive to enter, especially once um, an aggregator has settled into a, a significant number one position, right? Because you know, fundamentally, this is an aggregator. This is an aggregator industry, like real estate, like food, like anything that an aggregator will do. Normally, what you have is a very big number one player that has a very significant profitability, very large war chest. Then you would probably have a number two player, which would not have that much of a scale, but they can probably still tie up their numbers to show some positive return, but you know, nothing, nothing. Great. And then everybody below that is just basically burning money. So if you try to enter any of the big markets, whether it's the Germany, it's the UK, it's the US, and so on and so forth, it, it's not that it's not possible, but it'd be extremely expensive um, to actually enter unless you have a very, very different value proposition. Right? If you're doing more of the same, it's very difficult to understand why exactly you're going to be successful. So to answer your question, you could, but it, it's, it's unlikely to be easy. Yeah, right. Because uh, So, um, Alex, uh, I think uh, Glovo uh, started in 2015, right? Yeah. 2015. So it's been like roughly eight years. Uh, so how has been the growth like? Can you throw some numbers on it? Like how has been the growth like over years and all of that? I mean, growth has been, to be honest, it's, uh, I mean, many ways it's been uh, reflective of, of the industry, right? So uh, the biggest, biggest jump uh, was uh, in uh, 2020, 2021, right? Especially supercharged by um supercharged by uh, COVID times, right? So this, this was very, very good. I think, you know, even to give you some numbers, let's talk about like the whole delivery hero group, which, which will be, again, numbers that everybody can find fairly easily. You know, they grew, I think in GMV about 30% 2021 versus 2022, right? Uh, so 30, 32% year on year growth uh, is quite, quite significant and you know and this was even lower than their revenues which was close to 50 percent year on year right and then obviously the margins were improving so you know global global um numbers uh in many ways are similar obviously global would play in some of the regions mostly let's say europe or africa compared to some of the other ones which might be experienced like in different dynamics right now but these were really the numbers, sometimes even triple digit growth in, in, uh, in some of the years. So I think it was very interesting times. I think uh, 2020, 2021, most of the companies were just trying to stay afloat, right? 
and be able to service all of this demand growth. Now the industry has really stabilized, right? So uh, again, you can see uh, you know big players like Just Eat, Deliveroo, Q1Q compared to last year, they were actually reporting a drop um, in GMV, drop in uh, in uh, some of these growth metrics. Uh, I think Delivery Hero did manage to actually have a growth, right? Uh, double-digit growth in some of the regions, they actually declined in, I think, in Asia. So, you know, could vary quite a lot. So, uh, the, how many, uh, you know, cities or countries uh, is Glovo present in right now? I think right now in 24 countries, right, it is spread across uh, Western Europe, uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, Africa, and so on. Uh, now, I mean, the number of cities, uh, uh, I'll need to double check, but it's definitely, I think, in the 500s or even more, right? I think uh, five to, uh, 500 to 1,000. So many, many cities. Awesome. Uh, so have you, like, uh, noticed any sort of pattern, you know, like, in which, which regions of the world, like, which countries uh, are, you know, uh, are better for the quick commerce market compared to the other ones? Has there been any pattern that you have noticed? So... I mean, quick commerce fundamentally to get it up and running right now, what you need is significant number of orders, right? Because um, say, for example, to get, a, to get one dark store uh, to be um, operationally profitable means it covers its cross, uh, it costs, it covers its lease, it covers its labor. Uh, you need, let's say, about a thousand orders a month. Okay. <coughs> now, right, a thousand orders a month. Um, you probably need, um, you know, significant, uh, or you need decent, decent uh, density, right? Uh, you need some affluence, right? Um, but but beyond that, uh, you can probably make this work in any capital. Right, obviously, depending on on uh, on competition, any country in the world. Um, and number one and number two, probably a lot of tier two cities, right? So let's say the tier two biggest cities in, in any country as well. Obviously, this is not talking about places like India or China, where you know tier two cities is really tier one cities and even bigger compared to say European uh, scale. Um, but in many ways, I think. There's plenty of opportunities across um, uh, any of the any of the any of the countries. What I would just highlight is, let's say Africa, for example, right? This would be a long-term bet, right? So Africa has, first of all, Africa is very difficult to talk about Africa because it's so different. Every country to to the next. Uh, you would have something like, you know, uh, from Uganda to Morocco to South Africa, very, very different cultures, right? Very, very different uh, stages of development. Um, but there, right, uh, building up um, your your presence and building up the industry and educating the uh, the, the local players, uh, the, sorry, the local consumers, this, this is definitely something that over time would be a, a good bet. Right, right. And also, uh, in India, what we have seen is that, you know, there are players like Zepto and Blinkit, which, uh, which started off with the, you know, value proposition of delivering in 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, primarily. But compared to them, you know, they, they have been still struggling for a really long time with their, you know, business model and how to kind of, you know, make money out of it. Whereas companies like Instamart or, for example, there are companies like Big Basket who has the uh, value proposition of delivering between 30 minutes to one hour. Right. They have been able to make better money and, you know, they have been survive, you know, without much of a, a problem in the industry compared to the, the 10 minute, 15 minute thing. Uh, so, so is that, uh, you know, what happening in other parts of the world as well, you think? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Right. So, so there is a big difference, um, as I said, right. You need to evaluate the 15 minute value proposition. Um, because I, I think fundamentally this this is a really hard game to to win, right? If this is what you you aim for, you know the immediate need, small basket, fifteen minute delivery time. This is quite hard to crack and make profit. 
in the long term and really you know fundamentally also get scale right because that's you know in whether it's uh uh you know let's say the grocer or retail these don't tend to be large margin type of businesses so we need high volumes to actually make decent money so this reflects, right, as you as you mentioned, right, Big Basket um, or or any of the other uh, players, which are actually saying, look, actually my retention doesn't seem to uh, defer that much, right? Whether it's every 15, 30, or one hour, right? Especially especially if the consumer is aware of it and expects it. So I don't tell them I'll deliver in uh, one hour and then they'll deliver in two. Right or say half an hour and deliver in one hour, right? But if I can actually get a value proposition like this, presumably, and they actually do, my operational costs should go down quite substantially, right? That should be able because I should be able to stack my orders, which means that I can, you know, deliver, pick up, and then deliver a number of orders um, uh, rather than just do one order per per drive, right? One or two orders. There's players who can do, you know, four or five or seven at any one um, uh, with, with any one delivery route. So I think this is definitely one of the ways that, you know, especially QCOM players could could look to. Uh, but this goes back against uh, again to the previous point is what is then their unique value proposition compared to, you know, normal normal retailers that they'll be able to do this themselves as well, right and provide much cheaper prices because they have significant scale. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, so, okay, let's now let's, let's talk a little bit about food delivery businesses. Okay. So, so, uh, you know, starting from probably, you know, uh, way back when DoorDash and Grubhub came uh, into the market to now there are like so many players in every part of the world, probably right in the food delivery business. Some have been acquired by the big players. Some are still, you know, trying to fit into some sort of a niche and all of that. So, you know, what do you think are, you know, probably three or four, the most important factors right now, if someone is starting a food delivery business? I think the first biggest thing would be to be clear on what you're going to be unique at, right? And obviously how possible this is. And I know this sounds a lot like the, the standard theory, but a lot of people don't actually do that. Um, and if you start a food delivery business, this is going to be exactly the same right, uh, someone like, uh, I don't know, your local player, be it Deliveroo or DoorDash or someone else, you know, and maybe your your only difference is that you're going to be charging restaurants less money, right, I don't know, your commission fees are lower uh, or whatever. I think it's, um, I think it, it's a very, you know, it's going to be a very difficult, you know, business to win, right? So be clear what your real value proposition to, to the end consumers are because all of these other changes, whether you charge less, less commissions, yes, you can, and yes, the, the restaurants will love you, but in return, you probably have a lot less capital compared to some of the other players, which means you're not going to be able to grow as fast, which means you're probably not going to be able to have a, a significantly better value proposition for your end customers and so on. So examples there would be, let's say, in some countries, there are players that specialize in some, some key segments. For example, home cooking, right? You could be a delivery platform, but you don't focus on the restaurants, you focus on home cooks, okay? And there, you actually might be able to do it on demand, meaning, you know, for delivery within 30, 40 minutes, or you might do it scheduled. Right, so somebody books their meals a day or two in advance, right, for the night or for whatever, um, and then obviously the value proposition is that it's uh, you know a lot cheaper, for example, right, and it's also home cooked, so a lot of the times it'll be um, you know let's say taste better sometimes, right, so cooked with a lot of love, um, but this is something that's unique, right? This is actually very different. It's very hard for these large players to. Uh, compete with you because they're not set up to work this way, right? They're set up to work with restaurants, not with such small players. They're set up to do on demand. They're not really set up to do a day in advance and so on and so forth, right? It's not that they can do it, but this is not what they do. So this is probably the first thing I would advise is be very, very clear how you are unique 
and ideally it's not about your pricing okay uh, one. Uh, I think the second thing would be just be clear on where this is going to end up right is the idea that you build up successfully a segment and then you exit to one of the big players right so I don't know you know the door dash by you because you've developed this sector now you're you know you're not that big but you've shown that it works you're profitable you know they would rather buy you than build it themselves then you can make a nice little exit or are you trying to you know bid, build something very very big and then uh, you know make a make a significant dent on the world where you'll be actively trying to compete with some of the big players okay right right and uh, have you have you seen in any you know a particular region where there is yet to you know come a solid business uh, be it in food delivery or quick commerce like there has been a lot of business uh, all around the world but you know mostly it has been like you know the us and europe where the, the the bigger players have come in and probably they have expanded but what are the regions where you think like probably if, if i if i can give an example say like a market like india right which is very different from uh, you know many other parts of the world so right so so that's why a lot of indian businesses in these fields have been more successful than you know outside players coming in and expanding here in this country so so do you think that that's the case with a few other regions in the world where you know uh, some some uh, you know solid businesses can come in from those regions and probably you know do better in terms of uh, you know how they grow and scale so so first of all even in india right and and even you know let's say middle east as well you know i think it's important to uh, first recognize that yes you have local players but you tend to also have large companies behind them right they could be local ones or it could be i don't know in the uh, example of zepto right uber owns up until recently a very significant part of them right so it is a local company but they have actually a substantial uh, substantial uh, international muscle behind them, um, but I would say that yes, the the local players, um, especially when um, you kind of move between, uh, let's say, move between continents, right, um, or the local regulations are are intricate, you actually have big advantage, probably bigger advantage, probably for the local players. So for example, a US player coming into India or a European player coming into India, not fully understanding the local market, um, and the local cultures, not having the ties, right, to, to local brands, community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there's many examples where they have failed, right? Many examples, retail, e-commerce, et cetera. Um, or whether you enter China, right, or whether you enter Russia, right, local regulations make it very, very difficult for international players, first of all, to have a large stake in any company that operates, and second, to actually be successful at it compared to some of the local players, right? At best, you might do some joint ventures with a local player, and that ultimately you will get bought out, right? So say, for example, a couple of weeks ago, Yandex bought out the rest of Uber from uh, from uh, Russia, right? So, so they were operating together. It was a joint venture, and then eventually, right? Obviously, now there's other extenuating circumstances, but it ends up quite often in a similar fashion, right? The local player, TV, they get some backing, they get a lot of know-how, and at some point, they basically cut ties with the external player, right? And uh, also, uh, you know, for a, for a lot of these uh, companies, uh, does uh, do they, or uh, especially if you can talk about Glovo, you know, uh, is there a way where you have leveraged, you know, probably some sort of data and customer feedback, probably, you know, some assumptions that you have, you know, st uh, approached, uh, you know, a certain problem with, and probably you, you have, uh, you know, uh, probably redone that or revisited that because of some data and customer feedback and sort of course corrected and that has worked for you. Has there been any such cases? Yeah, yeah. So there's many cases. So in Global, for example, there's a big, there is a very, very big culture of, let's call it, you know, trial and error. So A-B testing, you know, in, in its simplest form to understand um, what works and what doesn't. Right, so 
adding uh, a surface fee, service fee versus not adding it, what is the likely impact on, on growth, what is the likely impact on profitability, for example, right? Adding minimum basket surcharges, what happens, right? So I actually run tests, understand what's actually happening. So having access, real-time access to, to your customers and then being able to run real-time tests to have meaningful data on their behavior could actually does for global, but I'm sure for other companies as well, lead to much, much better decisions, right? It's not the loudest voice in the room. It's not the most senior person in the room saying what we should be doing. Um, if you have the culture and the capabilities to say, let's go out and test it, um, especially with the volumes of business, most of these companies, let's say the big ones have, a test doesn't need to take you know, longer than a week, maybe sometimes shorter, maybe sometimes a little bit more. Um, but there's many examples, right? Whether it's around frequency, what makes a big impact on uh, supporting customers to make orders more frequent, uh, frequently, um, whether it's around conversion, right? What makes customers, um, once they're on the app, actually make, a, make an order? Um, you know, rather than just exit the app and not convert to uh, to an order. So all these things, it's actually fundamental that you have somebody in the company, mostly probably be the product team, the growth team, driving this this and then testing and then implementing quickly. Right. And, uh, you know, also, Alex, uh, when we talk about, say, super apps, right, since Glovo is also a super app now, so we see a lot of super apps coming in mostly from like if you consider different parts of the world asian countries have come up with a lot of super apps compared to other parts especially you know in us and europe probably there are not as many super apps uh, as much in like probably the asian countries so what do you think that is like is there a fundamentally uh, fundamental difference from the you know how the customers approach a super app here in asian countries compared to europe or us so i mean <coughs> So it, it's important how you, let's say, define a super app, right? And then yes, global could be, uh, definitely, definitely could be one of it. Um, it could be that a super app needs to go through quite significantly different verticals, right? So meaning, let's say, uh, taxi rides versus food delivery versus ticket ordering versus, uh, I don't know, uh, table booking and so on and so forth. Right, so to, to get the true scale as a super app, probably you need to add a few more. Um, but to your question, so your question is, does some countries are, are better at adopting these than others? Okay. I would say, I mean, you have some very good examples um, in, um, in Asia, like, like Grab, which are showing that they can really command, um, you know, let's say better, uh, uh, better operations, better numbers, thanks to the fact that actually can the user comes in. I mean, that's the standard value proposition for a, for a super app. Um, but you would also have to understand that Asia, I don't know, like the South Koreas and so on and so forth, where the penetration of, of e-commerce, where the frequency could be, you know, is 20 times higher versus some, some markets in Europe. This would probably, if you can build a super app and build it well, this would probably mean you have an insane scale, right? Because uh, I think, um, you know, the average, uh, I think for South Korea, for example, the average uh, number of orders per month per, per, uh, per capita, sorry, per year is something like uh, 20 per year. And let's say in other in European countries, it's as low as like one, right? So, and this is obviously for the whole capita, right? This is not just for the use, this across everybody. So there, I think the adoption is much more likely to be slightly easier compared to say places like Europe where it's still kind of gearing up, you have some examples like Uber building super app, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's not as clear cut. Right. Uh, okay, just one more thing, uh, Alex, because it's, it's, uh, it's been widely talked about nowadays, you know, it's the, like uh, the hot topic. 
in the entire world i think that is ai right so is there a way that you know uh, quick commerce businesses or food delivery businesses or maybe glovo is leveraging ai in some form or the other to kind of you know grow their business yes so ai is i mean ai has been used for quite a while right i mean beyond the buzz, the buzzword companies in the industry as well as global would use it a lot for let's say forecasting right when you, you need to forecast your orders and in turn adjust your operations you know your career slots for let's say the the days ahead and right? it makes the, the, this could help there um there's many uh, other positive examples. Let's say the generative AI now buzzwords, uh, but you could have some good examples there. And some of the com- companies already are, are doing it, uh, whether it's use, um, uh, let's say, chat GPT to generate product descriptions. Okay, so you would actually have big, big examples uh, where you would meaningfully change the, the, the quality of product descriptions, which make a difference for conversion and so on. Or you have photos, right? So whether you use DALI or Midjourney or any others, you could actually get fairly you know, close match to um, what the actual menu uh, menus should look like in terms of photos. If you can actually prompt the system and describe the dish itself and give it a style, uh, that you is much, much better than, let's say, some stock photos that some of these companies have been using across their menus. Right? If you can describe it's a burger, it has, I don't know, thick through the middle, it has fries on the side, there's Coke on it, or there's wedgies, or there's like, I don't know, green leaf or whatever, right? You can actually fairly closely describe the, the, the meal. So these are some positive examples, and there's many more. Um, there's also some some let's say, worrying uh, type of uh, possible developments. So, you know, Google, for example, one of the big issues <coughs> that Google has with ChatGPT, for example, is the potential for it to be replaced, right? So users stop searching the, the internet uh, using Google's interface. They actually just go to these type of, uh, uh, type of interfaces like ChatGPT, and then I actually ask them, okay? So uh, it's somewhat similar in the food industry. You can imagine that, uh, let's say, an interface like ChatGPT, if you were to want to make a food order, right, you can actually go to them, ask it to order you a burger uh, from, you know, your favorite place, or for it to actually select you or give you a few options and then pick the best one, which is, I don't know, on price or on quality or whatever. It could do that automatically so there is no need to actually go through an aggregator for example to make that order or to see the selection when the decision gets outsourced to such a generative AI model so these are some examples right which could be uh, could be an issue for for the future obviously not right now but that's something definitely to keep an eye on right okay alex we are almost at the end of it uh, so just uh, now one one thing is that you know what are probably your top three you know quick commerce biz- businesses first and then top three food delivery businesses that you think are doing really well right now and probably you see you you know a very uh, bright future for them like top three quick commerce and top three and you can't say global yeah <laughs> I can't say global I can't say any delivery hero <laughs> businesses um, okay so I think. Um, I think I would say, you know, maybe maybe as far as top three, but maybe I'd just name one or two uh, in, uh, in, in each. So I would say, um, you know, quite fancy, quite fancy uh, in India, for example, the likes of uh, the likes of Zepto, for example, right? And everything they're doing, acquisition of Blinkit, I think obviously they have a few issues and they have uh, some way to go. Right, but I think this could be this could be a very very good uh, success story. Um, I think when it comes to uh, any of the other any of the other big players, I would probably you know isolate uh, Uber. Right, so Uber is a very it's a very strong player. I mean, they they have massive scale, they have uh, significant traction. Right, and a lot of smart people work there, so there's definitely something to look out for. Um, 
then I would say on the quick commerce space, I would say probably Gitir and GoPuff, right? So I think Gitir is definitely the player that's rolling up all the others in uh, across Europe. Okay, so even this morning, actually, just before we spoke, there was a piece of news in the media that the Gitir is looking to buy Flink, right? which is actually one of the other big ones. Um, so these guys just bought the realize they're buying Flink. Uh, you know, fundamentally, they will be the player, I think, across, across Europe. Uh, now, there is a bit of a question on how they can you know, get the cash flow and, and the money, right, to continue operating and survive long enough to really pay this all out. But I think they're definitely one. Uh, the second one would be GoPuff, right? Especially in the US, what they're doing, I think they have, uh, you know, very solid, very solid management, very solid uh, progress. Um, and I think maybe the third one, if I had to pick, would probably be Joker, right? So they focus now a lot more on South America. They took some hard decisions to cut out big parts of the business that weren't really, you know, they're profitable and were really burning a lot of money. And I think they're positioning quite well to win in uh, in uh, in South America. Nice, interesting. Uh, just any uh, you know the final advice, word of advice for you know people who are just starting up uh, with some sort of a business in beat, uh, you know, in delivery space. I would say uh, in any any part of the world. So if just you can you know whatever you have learned through your own experience in the, these industries. If just you know if you can sum it up in like a few lines and just if you want to advise them yeah so uh my my biggest advice is just be just be very clear on how you are really different and when i say different uh it, it really needs to be a fundamental difference versus some of the other players right because if all you're doing is have i don't know better graphics or you have a slightly better app or you have, I don't know, slightly lower prices towards, as I said, uh, restaurants, you know, that, that's probably not good enough to give you an edge to really, to really win anything, right? You might be able to compete a little bit, but fundamentally you get crushed. So that's the first thing, right? Be brutally honest with, is this good enough, different enough? And most of the time you go to talk to a few players or to a few customers, potential customers, they probably give you enough of a, of an idea. All right. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is be as quick about it to test it out. So have it as a rule of thumb, you know, as, as much as possible, close to three months, test it if there's traction, right? But never within six months if this thing doesn't work for if you cannot build it and test it within three to six months right it's probably going to be a very very high risk for you to build it in the first place okay thank you alex thank you for doing this uh, i think you know no, what what you said uh, in the last is like exactly where we come in as a company app script so we help a lot of you know companies and founders to you know accelerate their go-to-market so that you know uh, we we can build the, your product faster so uh, for example if if a product takes uh, say a year or two for you to build from scratch for example a platform like amazon right it's a very heavy built platform so we can take uh, take uh, bring it down to you know probably 4 to 6 months because we we have a you know a base product sort of built uh, which is a pre built sort of thing and uh, we build your product on top of it so that you know your go-to-market sort of accelerates and we have we, we come from a product mindset background right because it's it's not just about features and to make the app look good it's about the functionality so that's why our back end and you know how how your entire distribution and all can you know uh, be uh, be of some value uh, through this app so that is where we focus on absolutely by the way and uh, i have to tell you i mean with a lot of a lot of uh, players of uh, you know a lot of startups have advised and uh, and i've helped uh in the past not many have used similar services and some have decided to build it in-house and and my advice having seen what that leads to is to always i should try to do it with an external player help you to do it very quickly right get it up and running in three months and then once it works you can always in-house some of this over the years right absolutely absolutely so thank you alex thank you for doing this it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here and uh, i'm sure our audiences uh, must have gotten some great you know advice insights value out of this conversation 
So I'm looking forward to, you know, having uh, another conversation sometime in the future with you with some more interesting topics and how the industry pans out over the years. So thank you. I hope you have had a great time as well. Okay. Bye, Alex. Thank you for doing this.